Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. My co-host Walter Dial is buried in tax returns uh, this week and unable to join us today. So my trusted business partner, Corby McGordon, is, is going to come along for the ride. Uh, our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building transferable or sellable business value, and then for planning your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that's transferable or sellable and then exit successfully on your own terms and your own conditions. And if you've tuned in before, you know that we mostly cover topics of interest to owners who want to accelerate and protect the value of their business and then exit it, uh, and which often results in a third party sale. So most, uh, uh, a lot of times we're talking about the sell side of the, the transaction, if you will. Today, we're gonna go on to the other side of the table, so to say, and we're gonna discuss some considerations on the buy side of the table or when someone is interested in buying a business. And actually buying a business or having an acquisition strategy may be part of your strategy for growth and building future value. Now we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about why a business owner would consider growing through acquisition, common pitfalls on the buy side of the M&A process and how a transaction intermediary can be helpful in the process. And, and so our topic today is buy side considerations. And the guest that we have with us today, Lori Barkman of Stony Hill Advisors. Uh, Lori joined Stony Hill in 2021, bringing more than 25 years of C-level strategy and go-to-market expertise to, to the firm. As an exit value planner and m and advisor, she represents lower middle market clients from emerging companies to family owned and mature multi-location businesses. In her past life, she was a former middle market CEO and the managing partner of a private equity firm where she led deal sourcing strategy as well as due diligence. She has degrees from Cornell and Carnegie Mellon as well as industry certifications and now provides m and advisory services in Pennsylvania and, and really throughout uh, where in Pennsylvania where she's based and then across the United States. So Lori, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Pat. It's so great to be with you today. Good to have you. Yes. Yeah, so Lori, let's jump in. We know the business owners really want to grow and many of them have been growing pretty well on their own. And so a, a logical question then as a, as a business owner would be, well, Lori, what's the advantage of, of acquisition versus just continuing my organic growth? You know, organic what, growth. Yeah, it's tough. Organic growth is tough. And, and obviously the answer is it depends, Corby, because yeah. there's so many reasons why an organization would stay on the path it's on or to take a different path. And in the environment we've had over the last two years, there's been a lot of disruption. So yeah. if we just take the here and now, and where companies are today, they may have been experiencing a lot of challenges and they may have had to reset in a lot of ways. Their market dynamics may have shifted, their customer preferences changed, and who knows what's happening with supply chain. Mm -hmm. So there's challenges wherever you look. Right. And organic growth metrics, if we're tracking them, and hopefully we are, what's your customer acquisition cost? What's your lifetime value? What's your churn rate? So it depends mm -hmm. on the business, but any, any business would should kind of have an idea of what those numbers are for acquisition. And so what we might see is that business owners are feeling a pinch. Mm -hmm. They might be losing customers at a greater rate than they would expect, or they're have finding it difficult to, uh, so retention could be a problem. And certainly it could be a problem to get be getting new customers because some of the dynamics have shifted. So for example, mm -hmm. maybe it's because, um, preferences have changed when it was in the, in the heart of the pandemic, we wanted to stay at home, right? We didn't want to go to the health club. And mm -hmm. so obviously this is an extreme example where you can get your yoga services online. You don't have to go down to, uh, to the yoga studio. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so some of the, that's just one example, hopefully we can all relate to. And if you multiply that out, it's a real challenge. So also the other factor why you might want to consider an acquisition versus organic growth is part of the, today's show and all the benefits that may come with an acquisition. So we could talk about that side of the coin as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
are there particular questions or thought processes you listen for in an owner when they say, Lori, I want to buy a business? You know, are there characteristics that would that would make a, a business owner a good candidate to actually do an acquisition versus somebody that you go, eh, I don't think so. You know, it's an interesting question because it sounds easy, but it's hard to do. Right. And the biggest, the biggest statistic that I saw, it's just a shocker, uh, Pat and Corby, is that 80% of acquisitions fail. Right. That's a really big number. Now, obviously that's spread out across all kinds of companies. So what does that say? It says even at the biggest levels, you know, the biggest deals, and, and I can relate to that. My organization was purchased by FedEx. And so um, we saw <laughs> that up close. And I, it's still playing out. So I can't say it's succeeded or not succeeded. I'm not looking to comment on that. I'm just saying in general, you know, deals are being done at all realms of size of company and it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And when you go through an M&A process and you wait till the end to think about integration, how successful do we think that deal is going to be? Yep. Yep. So the biggest takeaway, I think, for the audience is that if you're considering buying another business in the strategic plan, yes, you should have a strategic plan for the acquisition. And by the way, you should be planning the integration at the beginning steps, not at the last steps. Mm -hmm. And so from an advisory standpoint, if I'm working with someone to say whether or not they would be a fit, I had a similar, I had a situation kind of an interesting story. I was, I was uh, introduced to this company. They are uh, founder owned and fam. I can call them a family. It's husband, wife, mm -hmm. sons in the business, daughters in the business. The couple is probably not in their fifties if they're in their young fifties. So they have some ways to go. They've been growing steadily. They're in a supply chain space. So they B2B supply chain space. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was introduced to them because I was told they're thinking about acquisitions. So I went in, we had a conversation and I kind of walked away from that meeting thinking they're not ready because mm. they didn't have the capability to take on an integration of, of scale. Mm. Wow. And, and I told them not that they couldn't do it, but in the meeting, I emphasized the importance of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. and I, 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 I'm due for a follow-up conversation with them to see how they're doing, but I, it wouldn't surprise me if they said, yeah, Lori, you know what? We're waiting another year or two. We're just not ready. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So internal capacity to actually absorb is, is an issue. And, and we know that some people acquire for strategic capability. Others acquire for capacity. Others may actually acquire for new markets are, are there predominant reasons why small to mid-sized business owners actually buy? There's a, a, all the reasons you said, and I think they, they're they good and valid reasons, especially now if some owners in the private markets are looking to retire and they don't have a succession plan. It can mm -hmm. be a good option from a competitive standpoint to buy a competitor and and mm -hmm. and, and get that market share rather than having to build it organically, you can, you can grow in another geography that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. You can, if you have a hub and spoke model on your supply chain, it's another way to expand that and kind of rethink that model potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take a competitor out is, is not a bad thing, but the caveat there is it goes to the integration challenges. We really got to think about that. If you've been enemies, if your sales team is mortal enemies with the other company's sales team, and now you're put together, how's that going to work? Another big reason you didn't mention Corby, but another big reason why companies think about acquisitions, especially in the tech space, we see this most commonly is an aqua hire situation. Mm. Aqua hire meaning... I'm going to acquire this company because I want their talent. I certainly want their tech. That's a big reason. I want their intellectual property or I want their customer list, but I also might want their team. Now, why you might want their team is because they're specialized. They have unique skills. You might also want that team because it's going to fill your succession pool. Yeah. You yeah. might have, you might have a talent gap in the company. You might have an age, you know, we'll call it age gap in the company, skill set gap, whatever it might be from a criteria standpoint, probably skill set, I would guess. Um, yeah. And some, and sometimes, and especially in family-led companies, when the next generation's not interested of running the business, 
uh, you know, you've got, you've got to think through it. And so all those reasons are valid reasons. Mm. In a family run business does, we already know that family run businesses tend to have a poor track record for second generation. Um, does an acquisition actually increase second generational success probability or decrease or do you know? I think that's another it depends situation. And what's the motivation of the second generation? Are they in the business or not? I, I have a podcast called Succession Stories and mm. I interview family led companies and, and founder led and everything in between. And I find the family story so interesting. There's a company called, uh, you might know them from when your kids were younger, if you have children, Highlights Magazine, if you remember Highlights. Their fourth generation, the CEO wanted nothing to do with the business. He, he didn't want to be in the business. He went to graduate school, PhD in physics, you know, amazing talents, and then eventually found his way to CEO, but it was a very untraditional path. In other family businesses, I talk to folks who start with the broom in their hand. And they start at the bottom and they work their way up. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why family members want to be part of a company like that. And then there's reasons people don't, they're just not interested. They don't have a skill set. Sometimes it's a skip generation situation. There's a local family here, very, very successful manufacturing business. And the father is a second generation. Okay. So he's gen two. My mm -hmm. friends are the third generation. The father started to have health issues and the, the third generation was just not ready. At that point, they were in their thirties, just not ready to assume CEO and other roles. And what they did was they hired someone in from the outside to be CEO. And everyone mm. knew that was the game plan is his, his mission was to obviously keep the business growing and, and, and be profitable. But his other mission was, was mentoring and leadership of the, the two sons and then eventually today they're, they're running the company. So it can sure. happen if you're really purposeful about it and you come up with a strategic solution like that, where the sons had the intent, they just needed time. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, so hey, Lori, you yes. mentioned earlier the, um, <clears throat> the statistic of 80% of acquisitions don't work out. And then you talked about integration and the challenges of integration. One of the things that we, are, we always bring up to, to owners who, who want to sell to a third party is uh, the idea of culture and how important um, uh, uh, matching your culture to the to the buyer is so important and how that could be a pitfall to a successful um, sale or transaction or integration what are some of the other uh, elements of integration that tend to be um, pitfalls and, and then too, not just with integration, but the transaction itself. Are there common pitfalls that you see in both integration as well as the transaction? Yeah, certainly the complexity of the business acquisition will influence the answer. There's a gentleman who's been on my show, Nelson Anderson, and he's done, I think, six or eight acquisitions in the Baltimore area. And his strategy is to buy mom and pop stand, you know, if you will, standalone smaller businesses so that he can really stitch them together very easily. And he maintains as much as he can, the existing management team. And so that's worked for him really well. And he's grown his business like tenfold doing so. And another example, um, so that's kind of the leadership side, you know, you have to give thought to who's really going to help with the transition and and whether you want to maintain kind of the as is and sort of become a you know nation state. So that, that's a one differential. Not all companies might see it that way. Um, another example is on the integration with the systems. So I did a, I did a webinar with a firm that specializes with salesforce.com. If you're familiar with that CRM platform, that sales platform, very robust. And there's a lot of bells and whistles to it. So once you implement it, it's pretty sticky, right? You don't really want to switch it out. You get everything in place. Well, what happens when there's an integration of two Salesforce instances? How do you handle that? So that was part of the, the dialogue that we had. And, and what that really is leading to is the sales process. And so this key, these key roles and functions in the business, you have sales, you have marketing, you have finance, HR, IT, 
when, when I went through the integration process with this big, big, big company, right, that I mentioned earlier, the main focus of where they started on the integration was the back office. It was HR, it was IT, it was finance. And there was, it was not a merger, it was an acquisition. It was very clear <laughs> that we were going to run their playbook. But in some cases where it's a smaller company, there might be a, wait a minute, whose system's better? Whose are we going to use? So that should be thoughtful in the due diligence process as you're looking at all those things. Maybe the company you're acquiring is doing something better than you are. They figured out a better mousetrap. Are you going to leave that behind or not? Why not, why not integrate that? If you've, if you've purchased that whole asset, why not leverage it? So those could be some considerations too, Pat. Yeah, and so when you're helping your client who wants to acquire, build that strategic plan for acquisition that you mentioned a few minutes ago, these are some of the, these are some a couple of the categories that you're going to make sure that they, they're clear on their own situation, and then they're clear on uh, uh, the potential uh, or the business that they're going to want to buy, and how they match up in these key areas: management, systems. Is there any other areas that you can think of? But we're, we're big on culture. We think that needs to be absolutely as best you can discern it uh, a match. Is there any other, are, any other categories? Well, I think it's all uh, over time. You know, you can't do it all at once, but the brand, you know, what's the branding of the new firm? Are you going to keep, or the acquired company, are you going to keep its existing name? Are you going to wrap it underneath and it's going to be a division of what's the transition there? A lot of times companies that want to say to the market and make the customers feel okay, like, oh, nothing's happening. And employees too, they want to know, you know, everybody goes to the what's in it, you know, what's happening to me. And so if you think about the customers, of course, they're going to be thinking about that. They don't want disruption. They don't, oh no, that my, my, you know, favorite vendor just got bought. Now what? They're going to change everything. So a lot of times the message for the first year or two is don't worry, everything's going to be fine, you know, status quo. Right. But of course, over time, things will change. So the branding, the marketing of the people for sure. I mean, that's really when I say HR and IT and finance, a lot of times those are the first things you look at, but that's the people side. And we, we don't want to have that be an afterthought. We really have to uh, consider the onboarding and the welcoming of the new people. The communications is super important. And the leadership, are they going to stay on, not stay on? What are their roles? And thinking through the organization, by the time the deal's done, the org, the org chart's already written. You know, that, that's not something you, you figure out once it's closed. You have to figure that out ahead of time. So yeah, I want to underscore what you said, Pat, for sure. Um, there's going to be a lot of decisions to make. It depends on, the co again, the complexity of the business. Imagine you're an e-commerce company and you buy another e-commerce company. Are you going to merge those platforms? Are they, are they all on Shopify? Are they not? You got an Amazon third-party store. What are you going to do? So it could be a lot of different integration levels and cost and time and resources that goes into planning a successful acquisition. Yeah. Yeah. So Lori, we know that uh, if you're going to buy a company, you, you do due diligence and there's a due diligence checklist with hundreds of criteria. And you've talked about strategy for an acquirer. But talk about what other questions does an owner need to be asking almost their internal due diligence? Am I ready to do this? Am I ready to actually do an acquisition? Yeah, an owner looking to acquire, I think, needs to be clear on why they're doing it. And for some of the reasons we said earlier, I think are all valid reasons because you need the talent in the company. You want to acquire different technology you want to make sure that you're maintaining a growing market share. You want to enter new markets, et cetera. There's another company that just as an example, they're third generation, they're in the Boston area and they, the two brothers are running the business and they are absolutely growing through acquisition and their strategy is to stay in their swim lane. They're in a promotional products. They're not direct mail, but they're in the marketing space, if you will, but they're, they're kind of specific on what they do and what types of companies are looking for. And that is absolutely their strategy. And so um, it's been a really core part of how they see a sustainable future for their, for their I think, yeah, like I said, third generation business. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other things to look at, you know, when, you, when you're evaluating a deal, it's really not dissimilar from when you're looking to sell your company. So if you want to kind of put yourself on the other mm -hmm. side of the table, 
we're going to for sure look at the financials. We're going to look at the strategy and the competitive landscape and what differentiation this business has and what makes them special and what, what are they bringing to the table for you? And, and, and by all means, you know, it's a conversation of build versus buy every, every time, you know, from a seller standpoint, you know, when the buyer potential buyer leaves the room, that's what they're talking about. Can we, can we replicate what they have on our, on our own? What's it going to cost us to do that? Yeah. So likewise, if you're looking, you know, you're looking to uh, acquire something, that's what you're thinking through. What is special, mm-hmm. unique, and how might I finance this? You know, is this a bankable transaction? Can I, can I finance the debt or I mean, do we have money in the bank? You know, t- uh, an independent company versus a private equity group, very different types of access to capital. So in this scenario, I'm really thinking about a company go maybe get an SBA yeah. loan or a conventional yeah. bank loan, and they have to service that debt. They have to have the, you know, the cash flow ratio 1.5, you know, to, to whatever, yeah. to the, to the, to service it. So, um, those are all really important. So the financials, of course, and ultimately what's the valuation and where do you think the strengths of the company are, where you're going to give them a little bit of premium or where might you discount and, and where can you make this work for you? And in terms of a, a multiple, um, the, the transferability of the business, the readiness of the business, the quality of the financials, the management team, the processes, are they all documented? It's all the things that you talk about on your show to help companies get ready for a sale. They can use that same playbook and just flip it around as they're evaluating a business to buy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned, you mentioned a few of the other people you, an owner wants on the team. They obviously want you on the team and their banker. Who else is part of that acquisition advising team that you work with? Yeah, I love and, talking and, about the team approach. I think it's a great question. Yeah, and, and let me just um, add something to that. When answering that question, if you could also explain or describe, Lori, how can an M&A advisor or transaction intermediary help in the, it, it make the process and the transaction more successful? Yeah, absolutely. The team approach is really important because we recognize that there's probably a quarterback, which hopefully we can serve in that role, right? If there's not a deal quarterback, that's one of the roles, Pat, to your question that we can serve, meaning we're going to be bringing both parties to the table. We're going to be coordinating meetings and due diligence back and forth and answering questions so that the business owner can run their business day to day. And that's important. We're also an emotional buffer. And this is so important on the seller side, but it's also adding value on the buy side because you don't want to get so married to the deal that you're going to get at any cost and make a bad decision. We can help, you know, provide that, provide that um, arm's length. And when you, you know, imagine on your other side of the table, if, if you present the offer and the, the seller basically gives you a visual barf, I mean, it just, you know, that's painful. So we can help buffer some of those reactions. Um, we can also help structuring the deal and advising. Now, this is where the mm. collaboration comes in because you want to have advisors who have experience in M&A, whether it's an intermediary like myself, whether it's a, um, an accounting firm, a law firm, folks you know, like you guys, you provide a lot of value from your experience. And I think there's uh, a, real, a real advantage to surrounding, if you're an owner on the buy side or the sell side, surrounding yourself with a team approach. And we're happy to play that role of quarterback. If so, there's another role on, on the team or someone's helping to do that, that that's totally fine. Um, sometimes we find that so on the law, on the law side, you know, the way typical lawyers charge, um, we can, we can provide some level of service that a law firm, not that we're going to do final drafts, but we can advise generally on the process and especially in the due diligence where, it's a value add where you might not have to go to your attorney for, for some of those things. And again, I'm not saying we're doing legal work. It's just some of the nuances of communications. Um, but we're not doing tax advisory and we're not, you know, going to, to get to that level of detail as a, as a fiduciary. So that's where your wealth manager, if you have a wealth manager is going to help you make decisions. If it's, if you're selling, of course, on the buy side, it's, you got to have your banker and we have relationships on all those sides of the coin. So if an owner or a buyer or a seller needs some of those relationships, and that's part of, I think of you guys coming on today is look, we collaborate. I want to collaborate with you. I want to be part of your, uh, of your network. And so the more that we are connected, the more value we can provide back 
to our clients. Clients don't always know who to go to, so we can be a good virtual Rolodex for them. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's a great answer. Um, flip side of that coin, and, and we'll wrap up here, is what happens, what are the bad things that can happen uh, when you don't have a transaction intermediary on your team and, and you're going to do a transaction, you're going to buy a business and you don't have someone who's skilled in negotiating because in negotiating because we get clients to a point where they're going to sell to a third party that's the if that's the exit route that's going to make the most sense for their situation then we're absolutely going to recommend that they get a transaction intermediary involved because we think there's too much downside uh, for not doing that so explain to the listeners what could happen that's not good if they don't have someone skilled on their side of the table negotiating the deal? Well, there's some watch outs. One would be the, the ultimately, again, on the buy side or the sell side, the deal terms uh, in, in your best interest and negotiating things that are in your favor and also watch out. So on the sell side, maybe you're going to consider a seller note. And what are the considerations around that seller note and in terms of the term and the, and the, and the interest rate and so on. Uh, you want to be fair, but you also want to be, you know, compensated for commensurate risk. On um, the other side of the coin is if you really want out and you don't want to continue on in that business, but it's, in, there's an insistence that you're going to stay on and you're going to transfer with the business. And ultimately you're just not happy. You wanted to be out at close, but now you've got an earnout. Maybe the terms of that earnout are more strict than we would have helped. You know, so I guess that the short answer is, are you going to be happy with that deal or not? So, and, it, and the sad truth is a lot of owners after they sell are just not happy. You know, there's some data around that from the exit planning Institute. And some of those reasons are the deal terms. Maybe there's no deal at all, right? Maybe there's just, it falls apart. Time kills deals. You've probably, you know, talked about that a lot. So we can help keep momentum. So if there's a deal, are you happy with the terms? A year later, when we, when we you know, see the survey results, 75% say no. Mm. And sometimes it has to do with ultimate readiness, which is a big value of what you guys are providing, helping to get companies ready for sale and owners ready for that sale, for that ready for that transition. And I super appreciate that. And the more ready a business is to get to the starting mm -hmm. point of a sale, well, the easier the process is gonna be for someone like myself with an M&A process. If they're not ready, we gotta go back to the starting gate, go back to go, right? And so that's the other side of why we see sometimes owners aren't, aren't happy with the sale. And so yeah, for, if there's an intermediary involved on whether it's buy side or sell side, our biggest value is to help you understand the, the terms of the deal, what's going to be in your favor and the implications. Where it can really go wrong is some of the examples I shared, but also tax. Like maybe there's just some tax implications. What if we did it one way versus another way? Um, and also the benefit. It, and it needs to fit where your goals are. If you're a, a, as a buyer or a seller, if you're not clear what your goals are, then of course you might not be happy with the sale. But the more clear we are upfront, what you're trying to accomplish, we can structure it to meet your your next, you know, what is your next? So what are you looking to do? And it might be the magic number and how close did we get, but it also might be these other aspects of the deal that not only add to that final number, but they give us other, these other elements of happiness for you in that transition. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's wrap up with some key takeaways. Let's just summarize uh, one for one that I, I think is very important to remember is to, is to think through integration. If, if you're going to acquire a business, to have a strategic plan, if you will, with the help of a transaction specialist like Lori and, and thinking through what integration is actually going to look like tactically. Uh, because it's not a small thing to take on. Corb, what are, what are some um, takeaways uh, from your perspective? Well, another one that just really stands out is, is the why are you acquiring? How, how does it fit into your strategy? I, I had a conversation with somebody last week that was in the middle of wanting to acquire and 
just when asking him why it, it wasn't clear, which, you know, it's, it's hard to do the rest. Uh, and then, then I think it is that, uh, you know, flip the, flip the tables and do the due diligence. You know, am, am I ready to acquire and are they acquirable? Just, just d doing the hard work of making sure that it's right. And, and I don't know, and Lori, would you, would you say it's actually, it's, it's preferable for an owner, an acquiring owner to kind of be leaning back to say, I'm not going to do this unless all systems are go, or is it a lean forward and, oh, let's do this at all costs? It, Probably somewhere in the middle. I don't think there's going to be an owner that's going to say, hey, let's do this at any cost, unless it's, you know, really betting on the com. I mean, you know, maybe you're acquiring a, a IP, you know, that patent and you're just like, oh, we got to have this. It's got to, you know, it's going to have such an advantage in our business. And maybe you're willing to make that bet. It's kind of a, what do they call it? Kind of you bet the farm, right? It's an all in bet. And, and those do happen, but probably again in the lower middle market it's a little more of a hedge a little more in a, you know interest rates are going up people are going to probably be a little more hesitant to do some of these deals on the pe side there's a lot of there's a lot of capital you know there's a lot of dry powder and they're excited to do deals they got to do something with this new fund that they have so some of the dynamics with financial buyers can be different i think we largely we've been talking about strategic a strategic acquisition and I think another takeaway is not only to have the success, success factors at the end, but the other value that someone like myself can provide in the beginning is all the outbound. It's not easy to get the right deal because it's competitive, right? Everybody is trying to find the right deal. So we can be your outreach. It's like um, an augmented, we can be, I can be your corp dev team, right? You can, you can maintain what you've been doing and I'm going to work for you on the side. I have relationships with some PE firms in that way, for example, mm -hmm. they don't have a, they don't have an inside deal sourcing team and, and I'm, and I'm helping them source deals. And, and what I can do is, uh, you know, virtually knock on doors in an anonymous way on your behalf. And I say quite simply, which is true. Um, and, and this is, you know, I think ethics wise, an important thing is look, I'm only going to say it if it's true, but I'll say, um, I have a buyer that's interested in your type of business mm -hmm. and they're going to pay my fee. And that's a very different thing than the sell side because the sell side, the seller is paying the fee, but mm. on a buy side engagement, the buyer is paying my fee and that can open doors. And that's a really important first step. So I'm doing the marketing outreach. I'm doing the pitching and I'm trying to get, trying to get you the meetings. I'm representing you trying to get you the meetings again in a confidential way, not revealing who you are till the time is right. That's a great point. Um, but that, that is a, another value. Yeah, that's a great point. Outstanding. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Lori. So one last takeaway or exhortation strong one would be don't go it alone with a transaction. There's too much at stake. We, we've seen, we, it, you, you know, there are a lot of stories we've witnessed, not a few of them, where owners have tried to go it alone and it just hasn't worked out. They become part of that 80% um, statistic that, that fails. So get someone skilled and experienced on your side of the table who can help you through the transaction and, and the integration as well. So Lori, thanks again for joining us today. Is there anything that you'd like to promote today as we wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. How can, how can listeners contact you if they want to contact you? Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. They can find me on LinkedIn, Lori Barkman. They could also directly schedule some time with me at meetlaurybarkman.com and it's L-A-U-R-I-E. And I, for sellers or buyers, I'm, I'm happy to talk to either side of the table and start with a business assessment. So if you're looking to sell your business, I can help, you know, if they've worked with you guys, they're going to be very ready, but it's good to know uh, where they are from a readiness assessment. We can start with that. If they're looking to buy, same thing. We can talk about their strategy and I offer some complimentary time for that. So meet lauriebarkman.com, stonyhilladvisors.com in S-T-O-N-Y is the website for the mergers and acquisitions firm. And I look forward to speaking with you. If you reach out, I really welcome you to do that. All right, fantastic. Very good. Listeners, if you want, to, if you want help in maximizing the value of your business or planning for your eventual exit, you can reach Walter, who's not with us today, but he will be the next time, at 301-951-9090. And then Corb and I at 301-859-0860. 
You can also access resources at exitreadiness.com, grfcpa.com, and nslp.com. Thank you for listening. And uh, until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Pat Ennis and Corby McGordon signing off. Thank you.